Uh, welcome everybody to the webinar um, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you especially to panelists. Um, so today's discussion aims to support um, a longer conversation on the introduction of incentives for whistleblowing in South Africa. Um, I'm Sarah Manny Gibbett and I head Parry State Reform Programme. Um, under which our work on public procurement falls. Um, as some of you may know, parry has been working for some time now on questions of public procurement reform. And about three years ago, um, my colleagues, Ryan Brunette and Jonathan Claren, who's facilitating the discussion today, began to explore the possible introduction of um, encouraged whistleblowing in South Africa um, as part of a wider set of initiatives to combat corruption in public procurement. Some of these proposals were cited um, by Judge Zondo in his commission's report. Um, so we hope that today's conversation will help unpack the concept of whistleblower incentives, the pros and cons of such schemes, how potential risks have been mitigated in other places in the world, and the potential application in South Africa. Um, we note that the Department of Justice has just released a discussion document on whistleblowing for public comment, so the timing of the discussion is a good one. Um, we would uh, request that given that we've only got about two hours for discussion, that questions from participants are focused very much on the topic of whistleblower incentives, rather than more general commentary on the state of whistleblowing in South Africa, although as far as those intersect with the question of incentives, that's important. Um, we'd like today's discussion to be fairly informal, so once the panelists have spoken and Jonathan opens up the discussion, please raise your hands if you're able to or post comments in the chat function or the Q&A function and we'll bring you in um, and you can engage with the panelists. Um, so today's discussion is facilitated by Jonathan Claren. Um, Jonathan's a research associate at Parry, as well as a professor in the Wits Law School and also at WISER at Wits. Um, our panelists today are Shope Elegs Bear Williams, Karika Fritz, Stephen Powell, and Parry's Ryan Brunette. Uh, Shope is a law professor at Stellenbosch University and co-director of the African Procurement Law Unit. She specializes in public procurement law, anti-corruption law, development law, and other uh, themes, and has published extensively on these and other topics. Uh, Karika is an associate professor in the Wits Law School. Um, her work is focused on tax administration, and she's written, including with other colleagues, on the possible introduction of whistleblowing incentives in the tax system. Uh, Stephen is head of ENS Africa's forensic practice. He's a specialist white collar crime prosecutor and forensics lawyer. And an early, at an earlier stage in his career, he worked as a specialist prosecutor for the South African Department of Justice. Uh, Ryan Brunette is a Parry Research Associate, and he's currently studying for his PhD in political science at the City University of New York. So thank you very much. Enjoy the discussion. And I'll now hand over to Jonathan. Thanks. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I don't intend to say very much at this point, um, but I would like to say thank you to um, Sarah um, for that introduction and very much thank you to our four panelists, all of whom I count as colleagues in one way or another, and uh, very much appreciated their um, making the time to prepare and to come here. Um, the I'll, I'll just say two things, one of which is that the idea here is really to be exploratory, to um, put out some ideas and be a bit, I guess, unafraid to have debate and discussion. Um, and I know we've chosen the right people for that. And um, that's because we think that um, these ideas are really important to get out there and to um, well, some of us feel to really begin to implement and put into action. Um, I, I should mention that, um, and I think this goes almost without saying, but that's why I'm gonna say it. Um, our focus in a way is implicitly on anti-corruption, um, but I know that for all the speakers here that um, really that objective interacts um, very, uh, very much and very significantly with the overall sense of a need for systemic reform and for capabilities strengthening and for capacity building. So um, although we are focused on anti-corruption here, um, that's really within a, a, a larger context of um, systemic reform. That goes in particular for 
um, some of the uh, what um, Sarah termed in the concept note for this seminar, the high value sectors of particularly public procurement, uh, tax administration, uh, and financial securities. Okay, so um, without then further ado, I'll have maybe a few more words to um, add after we've heard from our panelists. Um, I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to the first of our panelists. I'm going from left to right um, in our uh, sort of advertising. And Stephen Powell would be very pleased to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's good to be here. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this discussion. I'm very much in the coal face, in the front line fighting fraud and corruption, doing forensic investigations. And a huge amount of my time is involved in dealing with whistleblowers directly and engaging with whistleblowers to try to understand the allegations. And then my job really is to determine if there is veracity to what has been alleged. And I also do a lot of anti-corruption compliance work. So understanding where the whistleblower hotline and whistleblowing reports fit into the broader program to fight corruption is important. So in that work, what I do is I engage with whistleblowers all of the time. And I think that whistleblowers are a critical source of information. And you'll hear from the comments that I'm about to make that I'm very much in favor of incentivizing whistleblowers. And in the forensic work that I do, I've also engaged with many private companies who have adopted programs to reward whistleblowers. And what I have personally witnessed is an exponential increase in the volume of information coming out of the whistleblower hotline when incentivization does take place. The, the other reason that I'm strongly in favor of whistleblower incentivization is that when we look at the work of the Zondo Commission and the plethora of corruption in the various government departments that was unearthed and exposed by the commission, one of the comments made by the judge which resonated with me is that the judge indicated that the more important the disclosures that a whistleblower makes, the more devastating the consequences for such whistleblowers, such as financial and reputational ruin, losing homes, custody of children, harassment, intimidation, criminal prosecution, and the institution of spurious civil cases. And then those individuals also struggle to find employment. They're subjected to personal threats and threats against family members, anxiety and depression. And the final comment by the judge is that this retaliation goes unpunished. So incentivization is a useful mechanism to make whistleblowing more attractive. And if we look at the history of whistleblowers in South Africa, there are so many case studies of individuals that have been subjected to the worst possible treatment, despite the best efforts of the Protected Disclosures Act. The other point I'd like to make before just giving a quick snapshot of what other countries are doing is just refer to the OECD recommendations on reducing bribery. And the OECD recommendations are very much part of our anti-corruption infrastructure. The OECD recommendations are built into Regulation 43 of the Companies Act. And the OECD comment is for their recommendation in a revised report in 2021 is one of many recommendations they've made is consider introducing incentives for making reports that qualify for protection. So the OECD does seem to be in favor of incentivization and the US has been using whistleblower incentive programs for many, many years. Can I just check? Jonathan, can, can people see my slides? We can see, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. So 
the incentives are calculated as a percentage of the penalty paid by a wrongdoer, and it's between 10 and 30% of what is recovered in an enforcement action in terms of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So in its efforts to curb the bribing of government officials across the globe, what the US authorities have done is that they have physically made every employee within an employer organization a potential whistleblower because of the financial reward that is offered to whistleblower. And a monetary, strong monetary incentive to blow the whistle does motivate people with information to come forward without the negative side effects often attributed to them. That is a quote from Alexander Dyke of the Chicago Booth School of Business, who did a study on whistleblower incentivization. And it is common practice. And, and what I found quite surprising is just how far back whistleblower incentive programs go in the US. It started in 1863 in response to contractors defrauding the local government. And the main area where it was used prior to FCPA was the False Claim Act, which was revised in 1986. And this was revised to make the process more simple and more generous. And it is only applicable to cases where the government is a victim. And what happens with the FCPA is that whistleblowers are encouraged to report. And there you see the stat I mentioned a moment ago. So, so it's a big financial incentive that is dangled as a carrot. And you saw that the record award or reward paid to a single whistleblower is $279 million. And what the, the US authorities do is they advertise these rewards. So they actively encouraging people to blow the whistle. One of the negatives in this is there's a whole body of law firms who specialize in helping whistleblowers come forward to make these reports. And these rewards are available to non-US citizens for bribes paid outside of the United States. And it can, the whistleblower claims can be filed anonymously and confidentially. And it is uniquely designed to protect non-US citizens and whistleblowers are compensated if the information results in a successful prosecution. They're paid by the US government and the company and officials that they turned in may never know that a whistleblower even turned them in. So there is guarantees of anonymity or protection of anonymity. But in order to qualify for the reward, you obviously are going to have to disclose your details and particulars to the government. And the reason I want to emphasize why I'm so strongly in favor of whistleblower incentivization is that if we look at the SEC stats, there was a study that I saw in 2017, and the indications were that for the SEC investigations, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which inv investigates books and records violations against companies in breach or that fall foul of the FCPA, they indicate that approximately 15% of whistleblower tips received by the SEC lead to some form of investigation. The D DOJ intervention rate is even higher, a quarter. So for me, incentivizing well firstly whistleblower reports are a vital mechanism to detect fraud and corruption and as a forensic practitioner let me also just share with the attendees today it is immensely difficult to uncover the details because obviously with corruption the parties involved will be making every effort to conceal the nefarious deeds and it's very difficult to detect and foreign bank accounts, offshore bank accounts are used. And we do rely on fellow employees to blow the whistle. And at the moment, if we look at our country, South Africa provides limited protection with horrible consequences to many whistleblowers. And we need to reverse that trend. And when we look at the numbers that the US government makes through its civil fraud program, it we're talking about billions of US dollars that is recovered from companies on the wrong side of enforcement action. And 
you can see whistleblowers have been rewarded extensively in the United States. The, I also want to just quote Mary Jo White of the SEC. She said, the whistleblower program has rapidly become a tremendously effective force multiplier, generating high quality tips, and in some cases, even virtual blueprints laying out an entire enterprise directing us to the heart of the fraud. So I think that there's, there's a lot to say in favor of whistleblowing. There obviously are, it, it, I, sorry, I meant to say in favor of whistleblower incentivization, there obviously are some negative aspects, but I think I'm gonna pause now, Jonathan, and we'll come back to the debate around some of the perceived challenges and where the potential problems may lie, and I'll deal with those in questions later and in further debate. So let me stop sharing and hand back to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, and uh, great, thank you for that. That's, um, uh, that's, that's great and a good start. Um, we're moving on Chope. Um, if you can, Take the floor screen next, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Can can everyone hear me? Yes, okay, we great. can hear you. It's all good. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you to Stephen um, for setting the scene so well, and thank you to um, Harry for for inviting me to to speak here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to focus on I think some of the challenges that I think having an incentivization scheme will, um, will have in, in South Africa. So um, first off, I'll say that, yes, I recognize the, the impact um, that these schemes have had in, in the US especially, which is sort of the model that everyone uses and, and in the UK as well, um, because they, they do uncover a lot more, I mean, whistle, whistleblowing generally, but the incentivized whistleblowing uncovers a lot more um, should we say corruption or malfeasance um, than auditing and law enforcement altogether? So they are, they do work. Um, and I think Stephen gave us some figures. I think actually for, for the financial year that ended 2022, um, there was actually about two billion US dollars recovered in the in the USA from um, you know from whistleblowers. So the impact is there, the importance is there. And when these um, cases happen, of course money is restored back to, to the treasury, to the public purse, and the whistleblowers are compensated from the money that is, that is recovered. So in a sense, it's not taking, um, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah, so, so in a sense, it's, it's, it helps the whistleblowers, and I think Stephen has said and, and all that. Um, I think the other thing that I'd like to mention is that when we have these resolutions or these settlements, um, it's not just the fines that are paid, so other things are, are done alongside that. So companies, for instance, will be made to undergo compliance programs or restructure themselves in some ways. Um, and then of course the whistleblowing um, schemes have anti-retaliation provisions within them. Um, and, and the whistleblower is, is given a, a, lot, a, a lot of support because there's a whole structure around, around these schemes. Um, so I think the benefits are there and it works in, in certain jurisdictions. But I think for us, um, I would sound a note of caution, and I'll sound a note of caution in the sense that there are a few differences between South Africa and, and the US and the UK. So first, in terms of, of the functioning um, and the responsiveness of our legal system and our law enforcement, there's, there's, there's a big difference. We have a very different um, um, police to citizen ratio than other countries do. So actually, people going to law enforcement with um, you know, white collar crimes, I think we've seen from state capture, from what has happened over the last decade, that our systems are not functioning the way they, they ought to. In terms of corruption cases that have, hatch, have, that have actually been investigated and, and uh, being prosecuted by NPA, there's a whole raft of cases that were thrown out because the, prosecute, uh, the prosecutors didn't have you know, um, the evidence or the, 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 the cases were not watertight, even though the evidence was there, but just in terms of the way they manage and, and, and manage those cases. Um, so we have, we have a problem with that. 
in the US, there's a lot of organizational and, and I, I should say maybe institutional support um, for whistleblowers generally. So every public department, or every, let, let's say organ of state has an office of an inspector general to which you can report these protected disclosures um, and the, the OIG's office, their duty is to actually investigate and then make recommendations, gather the evidence, and then send that on to law, law enforcement um, uh, um, if, it's going to be, if it's going to be prosecuted. So we don't have those kinds of systems where, you know, we don't have them in the public sector. We, we, uh, we just don't, we don't have that, you know, that line where a whistleblower can take this information to within the organization and there's a dedicated office within that organization to investigate, to make sure that the, the allegation is, is true, to make sure that the evidence is there and all that. So introducing this without having the kind of, of um, structures that these other countries that are using this have, for me is not, you know, not, um, yeah, probably not the best way to go. Um, the other thing that I, I want to talk about is, is that, uh, again, so in, in the U.S. system, the inspector, general, in, inspector generals generally have um, 180 days in which to give the whistleblower feedback. Um, and then if the whistle, if, if in that time the inspector general has not, has, you know, not made a decision, the whistleblower can then prosecute in, in their own private capacity. Um, so there's, and, 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 and when these cases get to the DOJ as well, they are also you know, time bound in terms of investigating and, and bringing the cases before the courts. Um, and I think our, our legal system, or should I say our law enforcement, is not able to work with the same level of dispatch. Um, and under the US system, while, while cases are being investigated, there is, in, in a sense, they call it a seal or a gagging order. So the evidence cannot come to light, of course, because the, the, the case is still being investigated and all that. But if you think about our system where cases drag on for years and years, all that time, the whistleblower is in limbo. Um, there's no reward because the case hasn't been resolved. Um, you know, I can't go public or go anywhere else because so it's, it's yeah. So I think that will be problematic because our system just doesn't, our system functions in a, in a different way. Um, and, and also in, in the US, there's a lot of, of support from, from NGOs who support um, you know, whistleblowers who are obviously, you know, going through all the detriment that comes from whistleblowing. We do have some of those angels, but not to the same degree and scale that, that um, you know, that we have. And I think the other thing, which I don't want to make, make a, a big issue of, but incentivizing whistleblowers cannot deal with, I think, the biggest issue that we have with whistleblowers in South Africa, which is the risk to life. Um, so there's no scheme that can prevent um, the person you've blown the whistle on or the gang you've blown the whistle on or whatever you're going to call that, the criminal enterprises that operate in the public center from taking you out. So, and that is, I think, our biggest issue is the security to life. So I'm assuming that, or at least I haven't seen enough evidence from other jurisdictions that whistleblowers are routinely murdered. Um, so I think we need to focus on what the real issues in South Africa are um, you know, because, you know, I think Stephen has talked about, yes, we do need a holistic package, but in terms of addressing our issues, I think that's more pressing um, than this. So the other thing that I, I would say is that the countries that have had these incentivization schemes in Africa haven't, um, you know, have had to, to pull them. So Zimbabwe had an incentivization scheme in relation to tax revenues. So basically, if you blew the whistle on people who owed um, tax revenues, then you would get, um, again, similar amounts, 10 to 30% or whatever re was recovered. But they found that after a while, it was the tax officials were colluding with tax agents to blow the whistle. Mm. So there were huge amounts of recoveries, but it wasn't by, by you know, whistleblowers in the traditional sense. It was by people who had made a business of whistleblowing. So in January 2022, they eventually pulled the scheme. So, so I think what I would say is that I would rather that we looked at com real comparator countries, looked at where they had failed, and then actually learn those lessons as we develop our schemes and rather not copy from countries that we have a different legal history, we have a different um, economic, social um, history, and not much that is, that, that is relevant. Um, the UK, the US have had these schemes going on, or, or at least the US for, for 300 years, 
So copying that or modeling ourselves on that, I, I don't think is wise. And I think we'll be setting ourselves up for failure. So I think one of the things that I would, you would also like us to think about is rather, um, now with all these whistleblowing schemes anyway, all the whistleblowers have always tried to um, you know, blow, blow the whistle you know, within their organization before in the US going to the inspector general or going um, to the department of justice or, or going to the media or whatever. But we have to think about how do we create a culture of speak up, a culture where people can actually feel heard in organizations. How do we create cultures of accountability? Um, you know, and how how do we how do we do that? Because that I think would have better long term impacts on public sector fraud and corruption um, than in incentivizing a scheme that, if we look at our comparator countries, has gone left. So I think, yeah, thinking about. So I'm not saying <laughs> that this is a bad idea. It is a good idea. It does work. But in our context, I think we need to think a little bit deeply than modeling what has been done in the UK or the US because we're not the UK and the US. We don't operate like the UK and US. We don't have access to the same resources. Our law enforcement does not work in the same way. Um, and, you know, as I said, one of the biggest problems we have is a threat to life. Um, and I would rather that we looked at countries where this had failed and draw, drawn on those lessons, because if South Africa experiences anything, we will go left <laughs> with, with this, if we have this, and we have to think about how do we prevent that from happening um, and, and, and you know, design our, our whistleblowing framework in a way that it actually does what it is that we want it to do. Um, so I think I will stop there to give my, my other panelists a chance to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Sherpe. Um, um, just before I turn to Karika, um, <clears throat> I think it's appropriate to mention, um, well, first of all, just to say, um, as a person born in the US now almost 60 years ago, but in South Africa for 35 years in um, academia and research, it's interesting to hear so much South Africa, US at this point. Sherpe, you've mentioned the um, African context and um, uh, that allows me to mention that some of the persons uh, here uh, in the webinar are um, from the DOJ, and there's a um, discussion document out, uh, as many of us will be aware on, uh, I'm not sure the exact title, it's effectively whistleblowing. I believe it is fair to say that it focuses on whistleblowing protection. Um, it certainly does cover some African jurisdictions um, in addition to US and UK. So I think uh, we would certainly all agree um, on that one. Um, I'll have some more to say. I think at this point, um, Karika, one of my VITS colleagues, can you um, take us forward from here, please? Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan, and thank you so much for this opportunity to present on financial incentives for tax whistleblowers. Um, I think before I start, I should maybe say I agree. I don't think we should copy exactly what is happening in the U.S., but what I've done mostly in my presentation is to say if we are starting with a whistleblowing program, what are the things that we have to consider? So I am using the U.S. as a case study to show this is the issues that they've experienced and how that would translate if we did this in South Africa. But before moving to that, I just need my slide to move. And um, before getting to that, I thought it's maybe important to just provide some context about what is the role of whistleblowers in tax specifically. Um, in tax, we deal with an uh, imbalance of information. A taxpayer knows, or should at least know, exactly what was happening in his financial affairs for a year, where the revenue authority does not know. So that's why we would see that the South African Revenue Service has all kinds of information gathering powers. And this is where whistleblowing would also come in. Because with whistleblowing, it is less resources used by the South African Revenue Service to uncover the information as the whistleblower would provide this information. Of course, this information could show um, specific tax evasions, non-compliance. It could also reveal certain loopholes for the future. Um, so it's not just past things, it could also reveal things for the present when we have whistleblowers. 
Um, and then, of course, in tax, I think it's important to realize that we also have this compliance lottery theory, where a taxpayer, when he decides whether to evade taxes or not, would think about what is the likelihood that my non-compliance or my evasion will be detected, together with the penalties on the one side, and on the other side, what is the benefit? If, if I'm not caught. And I think as soon as there is, it's very clear that we are employing whistle or using whistleblowers actively, encouraging whistleblowers to come forward in tax, then that would tip the scale in favor of, okay, maybe I should comply because the, the likelihood of being detected is much higher than it would be otherwise. And the tax, I would, I always feel like we're special, so I wanted to specifically mention it in tax, but I think it also relates to other areas. The question about to incentivize or not to incentivize a tax whistleblower. And there's different ways of thinking about it. On the one hand, we have, of course, people feeling that it's the euros. They protect the tax system by making sure everyone pays exactly what they should be paying, despite the possible personal costs that Stephen um, referred to earlier. Then, of course, there's the other point of view where the um, tax whistleblowers are seen as snitches with unclean hands. And I think it's important to realize that in most, in all, generally, um, whistleblowers, in order for them to be close enough to know the information, to disclose information that's really relevant for such, they might also have a little bit of dirt on their hands. As one of the quotes go, um, tax offenders are not surrounded by angels and boy scouts. So we should remember it's not always necessarily that we have this virtuous whistleblower. Um, in this instance, I think last year with the VITS Law 2022 um, conference we had, Tracy Davis um, made a very useful point in this regard. She was saying, so do we choose not to incentivize a whistleblower? And then that means that the person evading taxes would get the benefit of not complying with, 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 with taxes or with the tax rules instead of just giving a percentage to the whistleblower to come forward. And I think it's really important to think of it in that context of it's the lesser of two evils. This is, of course, now if the whistleblower has unclean hands. Um, I also think there's some warning that should be there, um, of course, the Revenue Authority would not just take everything that the whistleblower says and, and run with that. Um, they would need to deal with it with the necessary caution because sometimes whistleblowers could be disgruntled ex-employees or ex-spouses. So um, something that's useful from the US and also Chile is busy who has a draft bill dealing with, with incentivizing in tax. Um, for whistleblowing, they have that a uh, whistleblower would be, there could be a penalty of perjury. So a whistleblower needs to know whenever they prov intentionally provide false information that there will be consequences. So it's not just let's flood the South African Revenue Service with all kinds of information. It needs to be accurate information. I don't want to stand still too long here because I actually want to get to the US board. So moving forward, if we assume that tax whistleblowing incentive is something that we should do in South Africa, um, as I said, I wanted to use the U.S. to kind of think of how it could work in South Africa or how it could not work in South Africa. So in the United States of America, specifically, they have this tax whistleblowing program, and they've had some amendments. Um, the most prolific ones was in 2006. So before 2006, the United States tax whistleblowing incentive program was discretionary. So there was all kinds of problems because it was very vague. Um, tax whistleblowers didn't know when could they say that they should get this reward. Um, and it was also not subject to any objection or review or appeal procedures. Um, after 2000, 2006, there has been an amendment. So the discretionary award is the last resort. So the main focus in the US for tax is on the mandatory system. So the mandatory system, first it has a trigger. So a whistleblower, that information should lead to an action for underpayment or criminal conviction. So there should be consequences for the taxpayer based on this information. And then um, as soon as this information that should substantively have contributed to this specific action, then um, the whistleblower office would look at the proceeds that's collected because of this. 
um, and then they would allocate a percentage and the range is 15 to 30 percent. So they have identified positive and negative um, factors to consider. For instance, if it's the kind of information that the Revenue Authority would never have uncovered without this whistleblower, that would uh, increase it closer to the 30%. And then there's also some negative factors. In this regard, they have, if the whistleblower is also found guilty for his part in this whistle, in this tax scheme that has led to this whistleblowing, then that whistleblower would get 0%. So they do adjust it according to how the role that the information has played. And they also have a threshold, so it's not all instances that would attract this mandatory um, incentive. And then the one of the amendments after 2006 is that a whistleblower can appeal um, the decision of the whistleblowing office to the tax court. So that it can appeal and say, we are not happy, I'm not happy with the percentage that was allocated to me. So for my discussion and just my focus is I just want to quickly look at the proceeds collected and the appeal to the tax court. So the proceeds collected, I think it's important to note that that means that the tax should be collected, should have been collected before the whistleblower can get the reward. So in the US, that's about four to seven years. In South Africa, I suspect it would be much longer. Because we need to remember, the tax dispute should be resolved. So that should be to an end. The proceeds should be collected. And only then could the whistleblower um, get his or her specific incentive. When we think about mandatory or this tax incentive, the question arises, should this be linked to the proceeds collected? And as Chope has said earlier, it makes sense because um, then it's a transfer from the from, from the taxpayer, in essence, to the whistleblower, and it's not ex extra expenses from the South African revenue side. So that makes sense to some extent. But I think it's important to think about what is it that we're incentivizing? Are we incentivizing because we've collected additional revenue, revenue we might not have been able to, or is there also some other instances? Also, what would happen if a whistleblower gives really important information, the revenue authority says it's, it's, it's substantial, but then the taxpayer is insolvent, so there's no proceeds collected. Is that not worthy of some kind of incentive? So I think there's quite a few things that we need to consider before just simply saying we link all of this to proceeds collected. And then the last aspect that I want to discuss in relation to the US is the appeal, so the recourse. And I think it is important in the South African context to ensure that there is recourse, either by review or appeal. But we need to remember that taxpayer information is subject to confidentiality. Of course, we now had a very recent um, um, constitutional court case where there's reading in provision saying now that the public interest override in terms of PAIA would apply to taxpayer um, information. So am I saying that in all instances when a whistleblower um, when a whistleblower wants to proceed with a claim against the revenue authority to say there should be um, incentive, should that always be in public interest? I don't think so. I think we would need to carefully think about when exactly and what exactly should be disclosed to the whistleblower in order for, to proceed with this claim for his specific incentive. And then Jonathan, sorry, I think I might be running out of time. I'm not too sure. Um, well, just keep going. Two sentences. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important also, and um, this maybe comes down to what Shopi was saying um, earlier, is we also need to think of the South African context. And the South African context, unfortunately, we are dealing, and whistleblowers, it's helping this, but we need to consider the role corruption would be playing. So there is a perception. Um, that um, there's corruption in government institutions. We have very clear examples of what happened in the past as such. So whistleblower, I think we could we could think that a whistleblower might feel that it's not worth our while to blow the whistle to such because nothing might happen. And then also, I think we need to realize that as soon as we open this door to say we are incentivizing whistleblowers, it's also another opportunity for abuse because there's another flow of money that could be um, abused by, by some people. And I think that's the end.
Okay, that's not, um, I know that's not your final end, um, Karika, but thank you so much. Um, okay, Ryan Brunette, um, my colleague at Perry, please. Um, yeah, we'd like to hear from you at this point. Thank you. Sure, uh, thanks everyone. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'll start with saying that South Africa needs to innovate tools for addressing the problem of corruption. Right? Um, I'm not going to belabor the reasons for why. Uh, you know, the country is facing a crisis of economic stagnation, unemployment, uh, poverty and inequality. Um, the state, uh, instead of moving quickly and effectively to address this crisis, is often seen as a major cause of it, with corruption implicated in, in what often seems like a an, ex an inexorable accumulation of cases of institutional decay and collapse. Um, the situation is dire, uh, and I think the country needs to see that every effort is being made to address it. Um, government efforts so far, uh, although notable, uh, have not been entirely convincing. Uh, in its latest annual report, the National Prosecuting Authority uh, reports 338 convictions for corruption-related offences across public and private sectors, that number has largely stagnated over the last few years. Uh, we all know that it was only scratching the surface of the problem of corruption. Uh, last year saw a surge in recoveries, up to 2 billion rands. Um, judging from the value of contemporary freezers, um, this number is likely to fall next year. Um, it is, in any case, we all know, only scratching the surface. South Africa is primed for whistleblower incentivization to begin to increase these numbers. Um, the basic idea of incentivized whistleblowing is to offer a reward to individuals who come forward with information which goes to prove damages uh, and or criminality. Uh, the tool is often used where states lack the capacity to, the, to themselves reliably, reliably gather information, recover damages and prosecute criminality. Um, Put another way, the, the function of incentivized whistleblowing is to reduce the cost to the state of gathering such, such information by encouraging holders of such information in society to come forward themselves. Um, the way it functions in context in which it works um, uh, is it doesn't act as a substitute for public enforcement, but, but rather a kind of force multiplier, um, which is available to countries with relatively strong and independent judiciaries, uh, which, which South Africa largely has. Um, and and uh, robust legal fraternities, which South Africa also has. Um, th these are features of the South African context that are, um, are out of proportion with our, say, GDP per capita and so on. Um, uh, we, we are endowed with relatively robust capacities in these respects. Um, South Africa needs to seriously consider such a mechanism. Um, I want to suggest that the way the debate around this mechanism has been unfolding is, is flawed. Um, the discussion currently hinges on the question of whether or not to introduce incentivized whistleblowing. Uh, the options are often presented as all or nothing. Either we incentivize all whistleblowing or, or we don't incentivize any whistleblowing. Um, such an all-encompassing conception can only bias policy towards conservatism, uh, towards inaction, because ultimately it's not hard to see how incentivized whistleblowing would create problems in some areas. Uh, and also to apply it in all areas, all at once, simultaneously, uh, would, pr would proliferate potential for unanticipated consequences, chaos, and so on and so forth. Right? If we present this as a kind of like all or nothing question, um, uh, the all side starts to look a little bit scary. Lucky, luckily for us, um, the debate about whether or not to introduce incentivized whistleblowing has, has already been decided. Right, uh, South Africa, the South African state already incentivizes whistleblowing. Um, it does so most prominently in environmental governance, uh, where individuals are encouraged to come forward with information regarding contraventions of environmental legislation. It does so in other areas. Uh, we, we issue bounties, um, the, the, the South African police service issues bounty, issues bounties, and so on and so forth. Right. When we recognize that South Africa has already uh, already has statutory provision for incentivized whistleblowing, it follows that the debate that we should be having is not whether to introduce incentivized whistleblowing. Uh, we, we already have introduced incentivized whistleblowing. Uh, the heavens haven't collapsed on us. Uh, the country still goes forward. Um, rather, the question is, where else it could be used? What sorts of disclosures to include within an incentivized whistleblowing mechanism? How to design that mechanism? And so forth. 
Under this sort of framing, most arguments against incentivized whistleblowing generally are reduced to arguments against the application of incentivized whistleblowing to specific sectors, specific sorts of disclosures, and specific mechanism designs. Most arguments that I've heard against incentivized whistleblowing um, raise issues that are that 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 you know either can be addressed by excluding certain disclosures from a mechanism that could be addressed by um, by by reshaping that mechanism in certain ways. They're not necessarily arguments against incentivized whistleblowing as such. For example, um, if there are overwhelming reasons for believing that incentivization would be abused in some specific sector by specific categories of whistleblowers, if the mechanism is designed in a certain way, then you know, in response to that kind of concern, we can either redesign the mechanism or limit its, ap limit its application. Uh, if, for instance, uh, the concern, just you know, off the top of my head, is, is that auditors would um, would would use this implement would, would would withhold information and then so they can later on pursue uh, uh, quit time actions, uh, then you know the, the 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 way to address that is to exclude auditors from being able to use uh, that kind of disclosure, right? Um, uh, the United States, for example, uh, doesn't allow everyone or anyone to to um, uh, to to launch a quitam action, um, uh, the the way the, the the statute works is that uh, people need to voluntarily come forward with this information, um, and uh, the legal argument is that uh, if it's part of a person's ordinary duties to come forward with information, uh, then they're not doing it voluntarily. Uh, this is part of their ordinary duties, right? Um, so there's all there's there, there's almost like an endless array of different switches that we might toggle. Uh, to design a mechanism that, that addresses people's concerns. Um, uh, in cases where the potential for abuse or dysfunction uh, in, in a sense of whistleblowing mechanism is uncertain, um, we, we, which is, I think, in most cases, we, we don't actually know what's going to happen once we unroll this mechanism, right? Um, the, the appropriate response to that is to start to experiment at small scale, right? To, to adapt the mechanism as we go, and if it works, we can start to scale up. And if it doesn't, we can withdraw. Right? So the South African state could start by tailoring incentivized whistleblowing narrowly uh, to, just for the sake of an example, uh, information provided by persons who are not required to report this information in the ordinary course of their duties, uh, information which goes to show, say, false invoicing on contracts funded by, let's say, the Department of Water and Sanitation. Right? So we could. We could confine this mechanism to a particular area, see what happens. Right? Um, Professor Williams Legbe mentioned that uh, Nigeria and Zimbabwe have, um, have uh, rolled out such a mechanism and then withdrawn it. You know, we could do the same. Uh, those countries aren't uh, collapsing because of their incentivized whistleblowing mechanisms. Right? Um, uh, the reasons that why they have problems are far broader. Um, if we can see, well, you know, maybe I'll finish with this. Uh, if we can see what the question before us in this kind of way, uh, then we begin to see the possibility of progress on the problem of corruption, of action now. Right? If we, if we, we when we look at countries, for example, that have moved forward with this kind of mechanism, uh, we can see that they never proceeded all or nothing, but rather they proceeded incrementally, right? in, in, in the spirit of kind of experimentation. Uh, and this has allowed them to make a series of kind of complex decisions in light of experience, adapting um incentivize whistleblowing to their own circumstances and so on and so forth this is the scientific way to proceed right you you, you try see what happens you keep things small you roll them back if there's a problem and then you you move them forward if it's working right it's useful to note in this context um that when the united states produced introduced incentivized whistleblowing in the 1860s the average american was poorer than the average average south african is now Right. The levels of corruption and dysfunction in that society were extraordinary in comparison to South Africa. Um, uh, the president who introduced the system, Abraham Lincoln, uh, repeatedly ignored and unilaterally overrode the judiciary. Uh, he was himself assassinated soon after he introduced that legislation. Um, but over long experience, uh, the, 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 the mechanism is adapted and now it broadly works. Uh, we, we can learn from their experience. Um, but we also need to kind of craft a mechanism in accordance with our own circumstances. Um, if South Africa wants to move forward, uh, I think it has to move forward in a similar kind of way. Um, uh, let's get going and and uh, and figure this thing out as we go. Uh, thanks, everyone.
Okay, thank you, Ryan. Thanks very much. Um, wonderful. So my job as the moderator facilitator is to, um, as has happened already with the panelists, to continue to get these uh, this idea kind of out on the table. Uh, I want to remind everyone we're in a um, actually a two hour long webinar. Um, and it's an exploratory space, a space where we're aiming to get a certain amount of debate and discussion happening, both or perhaps um, on two dimensions between the panelists, but also very importantly with the um, uh, audience as well. Um, so in other words, a lot of debate and discussion and maybe even a little bit of fight, but not too much fight. So that's my job to kind of keep that together. Um, I, I think since, yeah, I think I'm hoping that'll happen. Um, so let me do this. Um, I'd like to actually go another round on our panelists, give them all um, really just kind of two or three minutes. I've got a couple of clarifying questions that I'm gonna point, um, put to each of them. I'm not gonna do it one-on-one-on-one. -on -one -on -one. I'm just gonna say them all now um, and then give you each two minutes. Um, additionally, if there's, uh, and you've already been doing this, but I'd like to encourage you to do this a bit more uh, amongst the four of you. Um, if you've got comments or questions um, to pose, please do so. And then we also have an important question already from the audience, and that's great. Um, it's in the chat Q&A feature. Uh, it's what should happen to a whistleblower who's making spurious allegations. Um, and I, and just as um, we think about the answer to that, I want to do one bit of framing, which is to really say, when we when we are using the term financial incentives and whistleblowing, we are in fact quite interested in a space that is between what I might call internal whistleblowing. I think Chope was um, uh, referring to that in. Um, in part, and I think Stephen as well, as systems that are inside of, say, private corporations or perhaps government departments, so internal whistleblowing. That's on the one side. And on the other side, we've got um, whistleblowing at the level of informing or bounties. Uh, well, maybe bounties is not the best word, but certainly informing where in criminal uh, matters, rewards are used and um, incentives are used there. We're interested in a space, and I think the topic of discussion here is to what extent should South Africa be interested in the space that is talking about civil um, remedies towards recovery of proceeds and how whistleblowing and financial incentives works with that. So with that as framing, um, super interesting, everybody. Um, Stephen, I had I'd, I'd like a word on why South African companies are doing this in in terms of their internal whistleblowing. Is that because they see the state not doing this kind of civil, you know, the whatever the U.S. thing, or um, and so why are I think you can tell us why SA companies would actually be doing that in their internal. Um, yeah. I'm also interested because you use the incredibly impressive title of forensic practitioner. Um, I have an older daughter who wishes to be one of those, but I'm curious as to whether the, is there a professional association of forensic practitioners and do yeah. they do they not have a kind of position on what we're talking about here, financial incentives and whistleblowing? Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, thank you. Lots to talk about there. Um, and if you're, um, I, I know we'll be engaging and talking more about research, particularly maybe on those countries of Nigeria and Zimbabwe. Um, I guess one question that I want to ask to you is whether you think there are um, possibilities of adaptation and design, or is this a kind of, yeah, that, that phrase is really being thrown around, either or, um, you know, is it a question that, um, we really must be on off, or do you think there are possibilities of design uh, in, and, and let me phrase it for 
Nigeria, for Zimbabwe, and for South Africa. I know you're not an expert everywhere, nearly everywhere, but um, be lovely to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks. Um, Karika, um, you actually moved quite quickly past the SARS into you know, the US side and whatever, but I did have some kind of descriptive empirical questions on the SARS side, and maybe you can help us with that. Um, if, if you can speak a little bit, maybe almost more about the way that SARS, like what did, I, I know you're not a practicing lawyer, but um, how does SARS treat and informers or whistleblowers? Uh, you raised some of those um, questions. Is there, Chopin was raising the really good point of, you know, it's, it, it, it can be important to have a dedicated office within an organization that actually looks at whistleblowing. Does SARS have that? Is it just something that comes up in the, I pay my taxes, I think I do, really. And does it just like come up in the normal course of that? Um, I also wanted to know, Krika, if you would say that SARS has a discretionary system. In other words, is there authority to actually do what we're doing, what we're talking about now, but just in a discretionary way? I think that builds to Ryan's point about, um, you know, in some ways we are beginning to experiment or we should experiment with some of these practices. Um, there's more in your presentation too, but let me stop there. Um, and then Ryan, do you think, um, am I being fair and good on this kind of three-part distinction? Can we separate internal whistleblowing from whatever you want to call it, ketom or incentivized civil claims whistleblowing and then criminal side? Uh, I think you heard Chope was arguing, you know, we really got to get the basics right at the organizational level and, you know, not to worry so much about the other two. What do you think about that? three-part analysis. Um, and yeah, I will ask a slightly provocative question. Let me do it to you, Ryan, since we've worked together on this for so long. Would you call the Protected Disclosures Act itself an experimentation? Um, we've got a DOJ um, discussion document out there. In fact, it covers some of the police bounties and the environmental um, uh, incentives, in, incentives for disclosing environmental risks, and then uh, I think it's 25% of the fine and so on. Uh, so would you call the PDA itself an experiment? And if so, you know, how's it going? Um, and I'd like to remind all of you of the audience question around what happens to spurious allegations. Okay, three minutes each. Stephen, you're up. Thank you. Stephen, you're... Yeah. Sorry, got it. Thanks. The first, first question, why would private companies incentivize whistleblowing? The volume of fraud and corruption out there in South Africa globally is just, it, it has increased exponentially. During COVID, we've just had a proliferation of white collar crime, fraud exposure. So companies are trying to curb losses and they're looking at in desperation ways to tap into the abundance of knowledge that people have. When syndicates, for example, attack one of the retailers and they're stealing from the distribution centers, colleagues notice what they're doing. They accumulate high value stock, hide it in a particular section of the warehouse. It's very difficult. The, the perpetrators know where the cameras are. They know which cameras are not working, which cameras are just dummies. And so what the companies are tapping into is those individual colleagues who can see what is happening. And sometimes it's just a symptom of a colleague going out to lunch every day, getting a Nando's takeaway. They know I can't afford it. My colleague can't afford it. They're getting money somewhere. And by tapping into those individuals and, and encouraging them to blow the whistle and providing some reward, it is a useful mechanism to just unravel fraud and corruption that is costing millions of rands to that organization. So it's protecting the bottom line. You asked me as well, are there bodies that regulate the forensic profession and what is their standpoint on whistleblow incentivization, Jonathan? The two main bodies that regulate our profession are the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, which is a global body, 
And then in South Africa, we have the in Institute of Commercial Forensic Practitioners. And the two seem to both play a role in guiding and issuing guidance, training, etc. And the focus of both of those bodies has really been on protection of whistleblowers. And for our profession, we've got to understand forensic practitioners like myself are in a very, very dangerous position because we can unwittingly compromise whistleblowers by just referring to information that we receive from a whistleblower that the perpetrator will know exactly where it comes from. And so their focus has been on protecting life and safety because as we know, and as um, Sope was, was highlighting, it's a dangerous um, job to be a whistleblower in South Africa. I'm not certain as to their standpoint on incentivization. I think this is a debate that we certainly should be encouraging with both bodies, and I'll definitely pursue that. The, the last point that I want to just make while I've got the microphone, Jonathan, is, and I just want to respond to one of the comments that um, Professor Williams made, and, and that is that, you know, in South Africa, the criminal justice authorities, the DPCI, our investigative bodies, are not doing terribly well at this stage. And my response to that is the FATF grey listing may just be the injection of some initiative that we need to, to really overall law enforcement and how we investigate. I was also encouraged the other day, one of our politicians was speaking about bringing back the scorpions and going back to prosecutor driven investigations. And the last point I want to make before I hand back to, to you and my colleagues is that, you know, when it comes to copying what has worked in other countries, we have used the asset forfeiture legislation of the United Kingdom very successfully. We've borrowed similar legislation from the US and we shouldn't be shy to take things that work. And in the recommendations by Judge Zondo, he is looking specifically at what the British government has done with Section 7 of the Bribery Act, which creates the corporate defense of failure by a commercial organization to prevent corruption, which in turn forces corporations to put measures in place to prevent corruption within their own organization. And he's, he has recommended that we introduce that. He's also recommended deferred prosecution agreements so that we can incentivize companies that do a cleanup, find corruption to blow the whistle. And I think those are incentives for corporates. And at the same, we've got to incentivize the individuals on the ground. And those are just some preliminary thoughts I wanted to share at this stage. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Stephen. Um, let's see, um, Shope, are you? Yeah. Great, yeah. thank you. Okay, um, okay so your, your question was about adaptation and, and how we, we structure this. So I think, I, I, I think, as I said, that I'm not saying that it's something that needs to be um, forsworn, but that we need to think about how it works. And I think a policy design that takes into account our circumstances, I think would be beneficial. So. And, I and I'm focusing on um, incentivized whistleblowing in the public sector, especially for things like procurement, corruption, and, and you know, some of the stuff that we've seen. Um, so I, so let, me, let me talk about Nigeria. So Nigeria, I, even though I said Nigeria didn't work, it was working, um, and I'll, I'll just tell you why. So it wasn't a, a piece of legislation. It was basically a government policy or an, uh, an executive order from the president or something like that. So it didn't have that formal status. And I think that helped because it wasn't going through the, the criminal justice system in that sense. Um, so what it was, it, and it was also ring fence in that it was limited to, um, so whistleblowers were incentivized to report where there had been embezzlement of public funds. And so the policy, because that, that was one of the big problems. It wasn't, so, I mean, there was procurement fraud and all that, but it was like, basically people just stealing government money, like taking it home. So the policy was like, if you can tell us where public monies are, uh, are being hidden and they're not in the banking system, then you would get, I think then it was 5% of, of the recovered monies. Um, and of course you can imagine that if, if a, a minister or politician or some public official has government money stored in his house or in his guest apartment, he's not carrying it by himself. 
because we're talking about physical cash. So that cash is being carried by chauffeurs and you know uh, domestic workers, et cetera, et cetera. So all these domestic workers and chauffeurs began to say, you know, my boss has money here. There's money stored here and all that. And we started, rec and we were recovering really millions of US dollars. Um, and it was working very well. And, you know, the, 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 the incentives were being paid. So you get, you know, we find a million US dollars stuck in this apartment, you get 5% of that. But somewhere in that system, and so there was a lot of recovery, like you can't imagine, you know, uh, but somewhere in that, the government then decided that the amounts being recovered were so large that the incentives being paid were obviously were also large. And a lot of it was in US dollars because Nigerian currency is not, not that stable. Um, and so at some point, the, the government then decided that for anyone who um, incense, uh, who blows the whistle and has this incentive, money's recovered and has this incentive coming to them, the person will have to provide a psychiatric evaluation to show that they were able to manage the amounts of the incentive coming to them, which is insane. And basically that's how the policy just frittered, just disappeared because people were like, <laughs> you know, what the hell, this is not, you know, so, so that was that. So it was working and it was ring fenced to embezzlement of public fund. And we were having those recoveries, but it didn't go to the criminal justice system. So some of the issues that we would have with the way the criminal justice system works and the delays and all that, we didn't have that. Um, so I would think that if we, we can have a policy design that takes into account, okay, where, where are the biggest pain points? Ring fence it. I like what Ryan said that, you know, we can start small, ring fence it like Nigeria did. That was their pain point was embezzlement of public money. Um, and it doesn't have to be legislation. It doesn't have to follow that kind of formality because, you know, it, it might not be necessary to achieve whatever we want to, um, you know, want to achieve under, under, the, under the, the policy design. So I think I will, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Shope. That's wonderful. You got to write that up. It'll be one of the best read law review articles we do. Thank you. Um, Karika. I think before I get to my questions, I just wanted to mention that um, taking from Ryan's approach, saying that we shouldn't see it as either or, we should incentivize or we should not. Um, I see a comment in the chat, which basically comes down when we look at the jurisdictions, it doesn't need to be either or. We could use look at more developing developed countries who has experience and has developed their programs. And some of those reflect the institutional, architectural, social, political, and economic, sorry, I can't read further down in the chat, profiles of South Africa. So I think that's important that we realize it's not just one thing and that's it. We, we can look at different jurisdictions. We could look at different ways in doing these incentives. Going to the whistleblowing at SAR, so um, I think in this instance, it's maybe to my advantage that I'm not a practicing, that I don't work at SAR and I, that I'm not in um, a tax attorney because I think it's ultimately important to know what is available to the public in relation to whistleblowing. Because what does it help if there is, and I've heard murmurs of there's maybe something, some kind of thing, or there used to be something at SAR, but if it's not something that's made public, it can't extract all the benefit that it's supposed to do. And it's also important that we have very clear guidelines on how it works. We can't just have a, a silent system where the, for the whistleblowing program. So at this moment, what's available to the public is there's a link where you can blow the whistle if there's some, some kind of information. And then, I mean, I don't work at such, I don't know exactly how they would deal with the whistleblowing claims, but taking from what, what has happened in the US, they used to deal with the whistleblowing claims, each division on their own as it came in. And they realized that, that it was inconsistent application, especially at that stage, it was completely in the discretion of the revenue authority, um, when to incentivize and when not. Um, so they have a centralized whistleblowers office. So they have to report to um, government once a year, I think it's once a year, they need to give reports, show how effective the whistleblowing program is. So I think that is definitely something that SASH would need to consider if they incentivize whistleblowers, is to make sure it's centralized, so it's consistent application. It's also then to identify issues. And um, there was something else that I wanted to say, and yes, of course, I mean, it's important that we have very clear guidelines about how it's gonna work or how it's working, and it can't be something that happens in secret, I think. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Karika, I want to press you just very quickly. So I'm actually reading you, first of all, you've ignored my question, thank you. But I asked, is it fair to call the SARS system discretionary? And would you say yes? You could, if you want to beg off, you can beg off, but. So Jonathan, I think I ignored it because I didn't completely understand what you mean by discretionary in what, in what sense? Well, I think what you're pointing to right now is the degree to which SARS, and, and you're saying two things. One is um, really important that SARS actually is public with whatever it's doing on whistleblowing. Yeah. And um, there doesn't, reading from you, you know, there's not more than just a portal in. But um, is, it, uh, is there authority in your reading of the tax administration and the SARS legislation to um, discretionarily treat that whistleblowing um, information uh, in the regulation of a person's tax affairs. If you okay, so Jonathan, sorry, when you, when you say treat, well, what exactly are you referring to? Sorry, it feels like mm -hmm. I'm turning the table. <laughs> sorry. Okay, I think we'll um, let's leave it there for now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because I think I think what's clear is that it's a bit unclear. Um, and yeah. That's, yeah. And that's important to leave it. There. And that's the problem, maybe. Yeah. Um. Sorry about that. Okay. Um. Ryan, someone else who I've cross-examined at various times. Over to you. Cool. Um. Yeah. So on this kind of like question of um. I mean, you know, like this kind of like should. There, there is this question of like you know the organizational framework and that sort of thing and like obviously whistleblowers or whistleblowing is this kind of like complex thing that needs interventions across a kind of broad front right uh, including kind of like i mean what you suggest like internal whistleblowing external incentivization you know all that sort of thing um uh, i don't think it's a, a kind of either or thing um uh you know what what we have here, and you know, you can kind of see how I'm coming at this because yeah, you know, I'm I'm a political scientist and I do kind of comparative politics and policy, right? Um, and you know, what what I, what I understand about these situations is that um, you know, when when a policy window opens, uh, we we should use it to address issues across a broad front, right? Um, you know, the policy window is opening here uh, around Protected Disclosures Act, um, around stuff like the Public Procurement Bill and so on. Um, we're, we're, which has some relevance for incentivized whistleblowing. Um, and that policy window is not going to stay open forever. Uh, and once it closes, it's not going to open again for another five, 10 years, right? Um, so, you know, we, we shouldn't treat this as either or thing. Um, we, we, we should try to address these issues across a broad front. Um, and, you know, along those lines, like, the, you know, the PDA could include, the, the protected disclosures that could include just a, you know, a clause uh, that that guides the executive that that you know suggests that it can uh, establish incentivization for specific areas of of um, protected disclosures, um, specific kinds of protected disclosures, and so on um, uh, in regulations. Right. So you know, create the legal power, um, uh, the guidance, and so on, and then start to roll that out uh, in a more experimental way, way lower down. Um, and, you know, partly what they would do is just, you know, like inspire confidence that these issues are being addressed and so on and so forth, right? Um, uh, you know, if, if government's coming out with new interesting ways to address these problems of corruption, you know, that's one way to kind of start to turn the narrative and, uh, and, and to, um, you know, show the public that, uh, that, that these issues are being addressed, that, that movement is being made and so on. Um, is the PDA itself, so the second question you mentioned, Jonathan, um, is the PDA itself experimentation? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, everything is experimentation. Uh, you know, the, the, this is, I mean, how policy works is it's always feedbacks, right? So it's, um, you know, the, the, a policy is launched, particular actions are taken, people learn from that process, and then, you know, problems materialize, and then new policies are launched, and so on and so forth, right? Um, you know, we, we we should be looking at other countries and we should be looking at the United States, we should be looking at Nigeria, we should be looking at Zimbabwe, um, we should be looking at, you know, like other kind of middle income countries, like, uh, you know, countries in Latin America, in Southeast Asia and so on, that may be experimenting with incentivization in a whole range of ways. Um, but we should also be looking at ourselves, right? So, you know, as I've suggested, we, we have some experience with incentivized whistleblowing. Um, 
in environmental governance, for example. Uh, I don't think we know a great deal about, I mean, at least people outside the state, I don't think we know a great deal about how that's actually working. I, I haven't personally looked at it very closely. I haven't had the time. Um, I, I suspect from what I understand that uh, it, it, it's not used very regularly, uh, but I stand to be corrected. Maybe maybe there's a, a, a long, uh, a broad realm of experience that uh, we could draw on. Uh, similarly with, uh, you know, incentivization within private businesses um, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, bounties issued by the South African Police Service and so on. Um, uh, we, we we can we, we can get a sense of how this thing's going to look by 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 how it's going to roll out by looking at places where it's already rolled out in the past. Um, there was a kind of third question, which I won't go into a great deal of detail with, which is um, you know how do how do we discourage kind of like abuse of the system? Um, and you know I think there's a whole range of ways. Uh, there, there's you know like whistleblower incentivization really is this kind of like complex nuanced mechanism that can be adjusted in a whole range of complicated ways uh, to to attain desired outcomes um and uh you know stuff like you know if, if people are are doing frivolous uh quitam actions for example um then, then you know the courts can respond to that there, there's a whole range of mechanisms to discourage that sort of thing um uh, where where people are colluding and abusing the system uh, as as happened in zimbabwe um, you know, that, that can be outlawed, that those, those sorts of things can be addressed through criminalization, through fining and so on and so forth. Um, uh, you know, if people uh, make, make launch fraudulent quitam actions, um, you know, that's fraud, right? Um, so, you know, there's a range of ways to kind of curtail abuse. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of things we can do there. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Ryan. Um, I just want to pull up one comment from the chat, which relates to the first part of what you were talking about. Um, is it, um, my apologies for pronunciation, but Liesl Grunewald, um, I think was suggesting that it would be appropriate to use the term informants in the criminal context and whistleblowers either in the internal or the civil context. Um, so just putting that out there. What I'd like to do at this point, thanks to all, um, is to, um, so I think a large part of what we've been doing, uh, we've been doing a bunch of things at lunch, which is great, but reminding persons that um, we're in a exploratory webinar, we're kind of policy focused, uh, we do have um, um, government, um, well, whatever, employee policy uh, personnel who are here, um, I would like to, um, therefore, we're willing to get into kind of robust debate. We're also willing to have those persons um, come forward and raise the questions that they wish through the Q&A. What I'll do here now is um, to read a couple of the questions from the Q&A for our panelists. And also, I'd like you at the same time to actually focus a little bit on a question that Ryan just focused on, but he did it a bit more generally. I think what we would um, agree upon is there certainly are risks in financial incentives and whistleblowers. And um, if uh, each of the panelists could talk about um, uh, how, what, what might be a specific mechanism or tactic uh, in which those risks could be um, uh, mitigated. Um, I think the risks that we're talking about here are uh, abuse of the system generally, also the kind of tit for tat, the, um, I think, um, yeah, our colleague in Bongaseni Butelezi has talked about how uh, even the term of state capture itself can be weaponized going one way and the other way. So there's certainly that kind of risk here, uh, collusion, et cetera. So um, I'd like, if possible, some, um, um, discussion of the notion of mitigating risks. But um, before that and along that, um, uh, we have one question that's asking about, has there been thought around non-financial incentives? Um, are there non-financial incentives here? I think um, it's kind of an interesting question because it's really testing our definition here. We've actually said financial incentives. So, um, and we're also talking about high finance sectors, public procurement, finance, financial securities, um, and um, tax. 
So places where money is sloshing around. So maybe a little bit of reflection on that, please. I think that's what our um, uh, that question brings forward. Um, one of our persons has said is the point that there is, and Karika, I think you were talking about the information asymmetry. Um, the question is whether we would be of the view that not enough information has been brought forward to the prosecutors into the public sphere to prosecute crime. Is that why we're talking about incentives? I would have a clear answer to that, but I'm interested in the panelists' ones. Um, and um, I think one question um, that's also being asked is how is it possible to coordinate an internal whistleblowing incentive, perhaps with incentives, with this more public facing one? Um, is there a possibility of double dipping, uh, et cetera? Maybe, <clears throat> Stephen, I'm not sure if you've ever faced that particular problem um, in practice. Um, and then uh, is there, I think this is an important one, it's coming also from Dr. Grunewald. Um, she's asking if there is actually a risk of effectively undermining the PDA uh, or undermining the, one could call it heroism and patriotism of persons who have blown the whistle without any sense of uh, reward or incentivization. Is there, um, is there any inner undermining that's happening there? Um, and um, yeah, we've also got a question here. Um, well, sorry, a, a further question from Dr. Grunewald is who would administer the incentives? I know that um, Ryan and I have given different answers to that question at certain points, talking about the NPA, talking about the uh, key organization itself, so say SARS or whatever. So maybe a little bit of a reflection on that one. And then a last question here is about, I'll just read it out. <clears throat> Giving whistleblowers incentives will go a long way in addressing corruption. Whistleblowers see no motivation in reporting corruption as a result of the failure to protect them. Knowing there are incentives and that their protection is guaranteed will increase incidents exposed. Uh, protection is another issue that's being addressed by DOJ. Um, the U.S. example in FinCEN is a good example of that. So I think that actually raises, in a way, the question that I posed before, but in the other way, do those, does the work on whistleblower and protection per se um, need to happen at the very same time that there's financial incentives um, for whistleblowing and civil recoveries? Okay, I'm gonna turn over to those, to you hardworking panelists once more um, and ask for uh, one or two minutes of reflections on any or all of those. Don't feel you need to address all of them. Okay. Um, Stephen, I'm gonna start with you. Thanks so much, Jonathan. The issue around double dipping, what, what happens with internal whistleblowing mechanisms is they designed to unlock fraud and corruption and dishonest, unethical behavior that is damaging the company itself. What the incentive programs run by, for example, the DOJ in the United States with FCPA is focused on is where the company is actually the perpetrator of the wrongdoing. So it's two different types of scenarios. And, and I haven't seen instances of double dipping in private practice in the forensic work that we're doing, because essentially what the US government is trying to unlock with incentivizing whistleblowers, and I spoke about the 10 to 30% that was introduced by the Dodd-Frank legal reforms, which came into being just after Enron and all of these financial corporate disasters, what that does is it makes every potential employee within an organization who know that management, the directors, potentially even the board are corrupt and they bribing in order to win large contracts or tenders. It makes each employee that's in the knowledge in that loop of information, a potential whistleblower. So I think it's, a, it's two different categories of, of, of behavior that is dealt with by an internal versus an external hotline. 
The problem with internal hotlines, and this is a frustration I do come across with whistleblowers, is what you do when you suspect that the CEO or the board or the chairman are corrupt, who do you blow the whistle to? And that's where, you know, in my mind, the whistleblowing and, and the incentive program, that is something that should reside within the NPA Department of Justice. The, the other question I wanted to just touch on is, you know, what do you do with spurious whistleblowers and malicious allegations? And, and this is a very sensitive point, and it happens very, very often in the work that I do. We come across, we do investigations where we can see there was a malicious intent behind the whistleblowing. There's bad blood. We get the true facts of what happened. And usually our client is very aggrieved. They've spent a lot of money with lawyers, forensic investigators, and potentially there's even been adverse media, reputational damage, share price dropping, and loss of massive value to the organization. And the board and the directors and CEO want to throw the book at the whistleblower. And we urge them to be cautious because you've got to balance the importance of making sure that all employees across the board within your organization are comfortable in blowing the whistle. And even if someone is on the wrong side and they're malicious, it's sometimes not advisable to pursue them because you don't want to send a negative message to whistleblowers that this is what happens when you blow the whistle. And I must tell you that when we deal with malicious whistleblowers, they're the very first person to claim, but I'm a whistleblower, I'm protected. And I've had to say to one or two whistleblowers that we've engaged with that blowing the whistle is not out of a get out of jail free card for your own wrongdoing. If you've done wrongdoing that is totally unrelated, you still have to be dealt with. And the danger for companies is that line between the personal wrongdoing and bona fide whistleblowing is sometimes very gray. So, so we've discouraged people from taking action of any nature against malicious whistleblowers. But that in itself, you know, doesn't send a good message because you don't want people to be, you don't want to encourage malicious whistleblowers to think that they're going to get away with it. So I was particularly intrigued by that particular question because I deal with whistleblowers a lot and it is frustrating when people make malicious allegations and you can show it. You know, and when we do the work that we do, we, we tap into all kinds of sources of information. There's WhatsApp messages on cell phones, there's email reviews, and you get information which sometimes totally contradicts what the whistleblower has said. And then you've got that very difficult grappling with a, a, a non bona fide whistleblower. Thanks, Jonathan. Let me hand back to the team. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, Jonathan? Yeah, sure. Sorry, Hi. Sarah. Um, yes. DDG Play has raised her hand. Um, I don't know whether you want to come in directly. Thanks. Um, um, DDG um, Pillay, perhaps you can introduce yourself. Hi, you uh, thank you, Jonathan. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the discussions this afternoon and for the invite. Um, so I, I have a few questions, but they may not flow in the sequence I would like it, but let me just ask it insofar as, as the presentations went. Um, firstly, with regard to what Stephen was speaking to in the beginning, he spoke to the positives about incentivization, and he said he would mention the negatives, but I haven't heard about the negatives so far, except for the, the kind of uh, um, making this a bounty or whatever, but I would like to hear a bit more uh, about that. Um, then to move on to some of our research that we did on incentivization. Um, one of the negatives that we picked up is that if you look at the highest fine that was paid to a single individual, $279 million. Um, so th th there's some negative elements to that in that you are benefiting a single individual as opposed to other programs, for instance, and let's take our country. For, if you pay a fine, it goes into the National Revenue Fund. 
And the revenue fund is then money that goes into the fiscus that is divided across different programs in government. And very important programs, whistleblower protection, you know, witness protection being one of them, then it's our supporting our institutions and supporting government programs. So then, so the negatives may be, one of the negatives may be is diverting monies that would go into the fiscus for the general good of society to then benefit certain individuals. So I, I would really like to hear a bit more about the negatives. The other negatives that we picked up is the cost of implementation of such a program and our difficulties to manage. Um, for instance, uh, we some research that was done by Price, Waterhouse, Coopers, which we reference in our document, and Tobeka can come in to talk more about that, um, where I, I think the UA, UK took a decision not to have a, an incentivization program for, for some of those reasons, but one of the most important reasons that, that I can recall now is that having an incentivization program does not necessarily increase people coming forward in, with information, et cetera. So, so you don't see an exponential increase. You do see people coming forward. The ease that it's called incentivization. So you have an incentive to come forward, but it does not necessarily give you the results of increased prosecution and, and, and people being brought to book because of it. And, and that is why there's another question that, that we raised. Why would we want to incentivize, um, uh, for instance, um, let, let's take the corruption work, right? Um, do, what, is, what is the reason for that? Do we not have sufficient information? Uh, how do the complaints come forward? What is, the, what is stopping us from prosecuting and recovering the monies successfully as we stand? Is it because there's a lack of information or do we have enough information that we are not necessarily able to filter into a prosecution and a recovery? And yes, Stephen, I'm talking specifically to skills. I'm talking to forensic investigations because we may, so, so I think there's a lot of information that the Sondo Commission went through. I can't remember the, the number, but I think it's, uh, it's huge, but, how is that information now going to help us with the prosecution and the recovery? That's, that, that, that is the question for us. Um, so when you talk about uh, the NEMA, for example, and the fact that we do have incentivization in our program, I mean, in our law, and we, I think from our research, we spoke to the colleagues from the Department of Environmental Affairs. And uh, so they, we don't see a massive amount of prosecutions and 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 finding of people, or we, we don't hear a lot about the incentives, because the idea behind having the uh, whistleblower protection on incentives, uh, and no, sorry, the whistleblower incentivization in the environmental affairs is what Ryan referred to as the force multiplier. So our police force uh, does not have the reach in those areas uh, of the environment uh, all the time to be able to uncover the wrongdoing or to be able to come forward with the information. So therefore, they took the decision to put it in the legislation and to incentivize it. But I think we all know we're not seeing that much uh, prosecutions. I don't know whether the crime rate is low or what the issue is, but incentivization does not equate uh, higher prosecutions and recoveries, according to our information. But I'd really like to hear from the panelists in that regard. Then I would like to raise another point, uh, an argument that we made when the Protected Disclosures Act was being debated in the 2017-2018 amendment, because there was a call for uh, incentivization at that time as well. Um, and one of the arguments and, and, and what was in the space in Australia at the time, I recall one of the areas that we researched is that whistleblowing is a moral obligation because I think we also talk about creating transparency, creating openness, et cetera. And when you talk to the negatives, I think it's very important for us to understand the kind of culture we want to encourage in our, in our country. What do we want to grow in our country? We want to grow people who, who, are, who come forward we do not tolerate wrongdoing, and, and we want to see um, uh, consequences for wrongdoing. So I think 
but do we want to add a monetary benefit to it? And what has been the arguments against it in other countries? And, and does the idea of a moral obligation uh, still stand? Uh, because we do want to create that culture of accountability and listening to whistleblowers. And these are programs that are very expensive to run. I think some other African countries have put in place excellent legislation. I don't know whether it's Ghana, but there's one other country that has done it, but they've not been able to implement. Uh, so I, I want us to look at the issue of implementation and having these ideas in place and then putting it into action. Um, thanks, Jonathan. If I can, oh, all right, and please may I ask Karika one question, and that is when you spoke about uh, about uh, the the example that you were giving, you spoke about an incentive of up to thirty percent. So, is that thirty percent of the amount of the tax recovered, or thirty percent of the fine if the person is found guilty? Because there's a huge difference. Because I mean, imagine uh, finding a company sorry, recovering an amount from a company, which is millions, but then they might be fined a much lesser amount and you get 30% of that or 30% of the amount. That didn't come out too clearly, but I apologize if I didn't hear it clearly from you, you may have dealt with it, but I would like to hear that uh, more clearly uh, from you. Thank you. Thank you for now. Thank you very much. No, thank you, DDG, uh, Pile. Um, so just for all the participants, um, DDG Pile is, um, uh, in part leading, I understand, and um, yeah, this research, which he was just referring to also, and I'll put it into the chat in a minute. Uh, there's a discussion document um, on concerns that overlap with today's topic are not uh, only, there, there's an area of overlap. Um, I believe that discussion document is out for comments, and I think it's the 15th of August. Um, We'll confirm that. Okay, so a lot of questions there, some of them themselves overlapping with some from uh, the Q&A. It's really great to have this kind of policy interchange. So without more, I'm gonna go back to my fantastic panelists, starting with Stephen. Thanks, Jonathan. Great. Um, DDG, the, the first thing that I want to refer to is the, the US use of incentivization around the FCPA violations. Those are enforcement actions brought against companies that are accused of or suspected of paying bribes to win work or to gain a business advantage. Those enforcement actions seldom lead to prosecution we don't have convictions. It is a settlement agreed by the United States government, either by the DOJ or Tracy Davis at SEC is, is one of the uh, lead investigators on a multitude of investigations. One of either the DOJ or the SEC may negotiate a settlement. And what happens is very few of the companies, because of the robustness of the investigation, they identify email correspondence, WhatsApp communications, evidence of the corrupt activity, and invariably the companies capitulate and end up paying a settlement, or they get a declination letter that the DOJ indicates they're not going to proceed with the matter. So the first point I'm making is that this may not increase convictions, it may result in criminal prosecutions and may bolster the conviction rate. But if we follow the model that the US has used, you can generate huge revenue for the fiscus from penalizing companies that pay bribes. And there's a monetary penalty. There's a profit disgorgement element. So companies shouldn't profit from corrupt activity. And It, it can be both DOJ and SEC. So you've got two bodies that are pursuing the same target for different offenses. And I highlighted that the SEC focuses on the books and records violations, while the DOJ focuses on the corrupt activity. So for me, that's the model that I think we need to pursue and why we need to look at potentially also the UK Bribery Act at the same time is because with Section 7, 
of the Bribery Act, they've introduced this corporate offence called the failure by a commercial organisation to prevent corruption. And what they, that then forces the companies to do is to have proportionate procedures, all the policies and the, the programmes to prevent corruption. So code of business conduct, anti-bribery policy, gifts policies, all of that. The next is turn from the top, leadership by example. The next is a due diligence to make sure that they're only appointing good business partners. Then they've got to demonstrate that they've trained their people and that they've done a risk assessment to understand where their vulnerabilities lie. And finally, they've got to have mechanisms to monitor the corruption risk. So if they fulfill those six principles, they can demonstrate that they had adequate procedures and whatever happened with the corruption was an aberration by a rogue employee. That's the mechanism that I think Judge Zondo had in mind when he suggested that we need to introduce corporate responsibilities for companies to have these programs and to introduce deferred prosecution agreements so that we encourage companies to self-report and when they self-report, if they have already remediated, fixed the problem, dealt with the individual perpetrators of the, the mischief, they can then negotiate a reduced punishment, a reduced fine with the profit disgorgement, et cetera. So, so that's, that's the mechanism that, that I'm, I have in my mind. And that's where I think incentivization can help. And you know, should it just be a moral obligation in South Africa, if we just look at the history of all the civil servants that have blown the whistle on corruption within their departments, they've been through the most torrid times. And so from where I'm sitting, I certainly think that there is a moral obligation and people should be reporting because it's the right thing to do. But we also know that there's massive risk and little reward. And if people are going to suffer occupational detriment, notwithstanding the valiant attempts by the legislation to protect the whistleblowers, we've got to have some reward that just outweighs the risk. I, I remember doing an investigation at one of the, the retailers and I, I knew that a particular witness had information and he just wasn't talking. And I said to him, sir, you need to talk to us. You need to tell us what you know. And his response was, Meneer, jy blei nie waar ek blei. Ek moet huis toe gaan vanavond. Die mense weet waar ek blei. Hulle gaan vir my doodmaak. And, and it's true, you know, so, so we're dealing with real risk. And I think real risk trumps moral obligation. And all we're trying to do is find some way to incentivize people to do the right thing. And I think it's something that we can experiment with and we can find the right solution. And I just wanted to also highlight that the UK has introduced some form of incentivization. They haven't done it to the scale as, as the Americans have. And I think that's one of the learnings we can take is that the Americans may overdo things because I certainly think 300 million is way too much money for any individual in one lifetime. lifetime. So I think we need to be prudent about how we incentivize and they shouldn't, it shouldn't be this unlimited amount, but the UK does have a limited incentive scheme. The Competition and Markets Authority can reward whistleblowers with up to 250,000 British pounds for reward reporting illegal cartel activity. And then Her Maj Majesty's Revenue Service also offers rewards for tip-offs related to tax fraud. So I think if you analyze everywhere across the globe, there is, I think as Ryan has indicated, everyone is providing some form of incentive in different ways. And I'm not saying we go the full blown American way, but if we do some form of a hybrid between what the British are doing with section seven, and we couple that with really penalizing companies that are corrupt, rotten and bribed to win contracts, we can find the right solution. The negatives that you asked me just to expand upon is that a lot of people who criticize incentivization programs for tip-offs indicate that this is going to lead to false arrest, entrapment of otherwise innocent people. And I think 
that might be a problem that may be unique to the US because I've what what I've been amazed at is how quickly the US investigators lock up potential suspects and, and potentially they stay in jail for a year or two before the matters are finalized. And often they get offered a plea bargain where if they plead guilty, they get a very light sentence. And even innocent people are sometimes induced to offer a guilty plea. But I think the, the acid test for any um, whistleblower tip off is it's got to result in successful enforcement action. And we've got more than enough checks and balances because the law enforcement officers are going to investigate the allegations. I think if there's no merit to the allegations, it's not going to proceed. So you're not going to have people that are innocent falsely charged because if the evidence isn't there to sustain an investigation or prosecution, the matter is going to be withdrawn. It's going to be nollied. I mean, we struggle and, and I'm not criticizing the DOJ, but we struggle with cases with merit where sometimes the prosecutors are just looking for a reason to nolly. So I think the reward requires a successful prosecution and, and you heard my comment earlier, successful enforcement action, not necessarily just a successful prosecution. And then the ultimate acid test is our courts of law. You know, a, a judge isn't going to convict an innocent person without solid evidence beyond reasonable doubt. That's quite a mouthful. You had quite a lot of questions, DDG. So I hope I've given you some of my thoughts on some of the responses. Thank you. Thank you for that, Stephen. Um, Stephen, I think I'm going to um, decree that um, that's actually going to be your final input, <laughs> and it was a good one, so thank you for that. Um, that's also indicating to my panelist, um, Shope, Karika, Ryan, I'll take you in that order, if you can uh, just be aware of our time available, and then DDG Pile, um, um, will, we'll, uh, as we round off, in other words, when I'm done with my panelists, um, give you a chance to say whatever you'd like to say. And then my boss at Perry is Sarah, so she gets the very last word. Okay, that means Chopin next. Okay, so I think um, Stephen has has really said it all. So all I'll just say in response to people asking what happens with malicious, malicious um, reports is that there's actually quite a high bar to entry um, in terms of the kind of information that 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 goes forward. So in the U.S., for instance, you have the offices of the Inspector General that would actually sift through that information to see if it's credible. So it's not like anything that a random person just wants to say will get taken forward. And, and of course, the, um, the other things that the information must not be publicly available. So there's actually quite a high bar, bar to entry in terms of that. The only other thing is that in response to we already have information and not much is happening. Again, I'll say what I already said, that we have to think about how the prosecuting service is, is currently working or not working. Because even if you have a flood of incentivized reports now, they will still get stuck the way that the current ones are getting stuck. So we can't get away from that. I think the other thing that we haven't really touched on is in many cases, especially when, we, when we're talking about procurement fraud and corruption, where um, you know, public officials are some of the, or, or, or let me say politically exposed persons. Um, so you may not have the same kind of um, fines that you see from mega companies, the ones that make the big headlines. If, you know, if that goes through, because these are usually individuals, yes, they might have some money, but it's not the kind of mega bucks that we're, we're seeing in the UK and the US. So we also have to think about whether those incentives are real incentives that, in those types of contexts. Um, so the private sector issue is one hand, but when you come to the perpetrators being public officials, being individuals, then I think it's a different ballgame. So I'll, I'll just stop there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Williams and Legde. Very appreciate it. Karika. Thanks, Jonathan. And I know I know that it's the focus is on incentives, but I think it's also important to note and to remember that the protection and the incentives needs to work in tandem. Because it doesn't matter how much the incentive is, if you're dead, you're dead, it's not gonna help. And um based on that, I just wanted to comment on something that Megan Labiskagni has indicated in the chat. So remember in my discussion earlier, I spoke about 
are the whistleblower might struggle to get information to proceed with his claim. Um, and it's also important to consider whether the taxpayer won't be able to get information about the whistleblower to uh, pursue his tax dispute. And I remember in 2019, I wrote in an article to look at what the taxpayer could do, what avenues he could explore to get this anonymous information based on legal things like Bahia or Paja. And I see Megan has they also mentioned this, that we need to look at, especially when the taxpayer is now preparing its case, what information would we need to, to provide to this taxpayer and that could reveal the identity of the whistleblower. So I think just I wanted to highlight that it needs to work in tandem. We can't just think we can pay the whistleblower because he's... Um, his name could be identified maybe later on. And then I just want to quickly mention about the collected proceeds. In terms of that specific section in the Internal Revenue Act um, or Revenue Code, um, they do define collected proceeds. Um, so it includes the revenue that's collected and also fines and penalties of the fines and penalties that that's administered by the Internal Revenue Service. So they do define it broadly, but in essence, it relates to any money that the Revenue Authority can bring in. They they would consider collected proceeds for that 15 to 30% um, percentage allocation. Okay, thank you. Um, Ryan? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think like on the, on the question of, of money, like whether, you know, this is a mechanism that may take money out of the public coffers and, uh, and you know, like whether it involved too much expenditure on kind of building capacity to deal with these cases and so on. Um, you know, I think in the United States, uh, it, it pays for itself and then some. Um, in South Africa, you know, it's going to be a little bit more complicated. The, the amount of money out there is less. Uh, Shelby makes a very good point, which is, um, the, uh, the 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 money that we'd be able to reclaim from um, you know lots of these uh, say operations and procurements and so on would, would be reduced by the fact that these are often like fly by night operations without deep pockets and so on. Um, there's another aspect to this though, which is also um, you know like the the role of this mechanism in kind of like bringing discipline into the system and so forth, uh, which you know we should to some extent be willing to pay for. Um, you know if we to say, for example, say, um, uh, include an incentivized whistleblowing around false invoicing, right? Um, you know, that, that's, that, that's, that's valuable because it means that, uh, you know, companies that are, say, double invoicing or invoicing for services that actually haven't been rendered, which is pervasive across the procurement system, you know, they, they'd have, there'd be stronger pressure for them to, to not do that and actually deliver um, services and so on. Um, and, and you know that 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 may save money in a, in another kind of way, in the sense that we'd actually be we'd actually be getting the stuff that we're paying for. Um, on the issue of like whether there's capacity in the National Prosecuting Authority and so on to to um, to to you know like are they dealing with the information that they already have sufficiently? Um, you know, part part of the nature of this kind of mechanism is that it, it incentivizes not just people to come forward with information, but also for law firms to become involved in in packaging this information in, in such a way that's uh, appropriate to launching cases, right? Um, and, and so, you know, like, if this works well, uh, the way it should work is that it, it draws in a whole range of kind of like legal capacity from private sector firms and so on uh, into kind of prosecution and uh, recovery processes, right? So, so in that sense, it really does kind of like multiply the capacity that's available for for, for putting these cases together. Um, now, on the issue of kind of like moral, the moral obligation to blow the whistle, um, I, I won't say much more than what uh, Stephen has said, but the, um, you know, if you think about SARS, for example, what, what, what they decided to do was compensate, to, to apologize and compensate, apologize to and compensate um, the, uh, the, the, the whistleblowers in SARS that were maltreated over that period of time. Um, and, and, you know, the way they framed that was that the conversation was necessary to kind of reinforce the moral climate in SARS, that whistleblowing is supported, that it's um, protected, and that, uh, you know, those who suffer uh, will, will be made whole again. Um, and I think, you know, so like, I, I don't think it's so easy to kind of like divorce these issues of, um, you know, financial, financial incentives from kind of moral climate because they actually, you know, in certain ways, they can reinforce each other. Um, and um, at least in SARS, that's what they thought. 
so yeah, I'll, I'll leave things there. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ryan. Um, let's see, DDG Pillay, I think a lot of the, the, those were actually um, not entirely, but in large part responses to some of your questions. Uh, is there any final, um, if, if you'd like to give a, um, yeah, want to hand the floor over to you for a couple of minutes now, if you're keen. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. It's just one final point, and that is in response to what uh, Stephen said. And, and by the way, thank you very much for the responses. And I think it gives us a lot to think about uh, in so far as how we go forward with uh, the issue of incentives and the whole idea of whistleblower protection. And it's very important what Karika said as well, because it all, it's also about the protection of the witnesses. It goes hand in hand. It's, it's, it's the full package. But just, I, I don't want to, I, this point has been made previously, but to come back to what uh, Stephen was saying um, and talking to the SCC in the US and, uh, and the issue of the DOJ. And, and there is the difficulty insofar as implementing such a system in South Africa, because their criminal justice system is totally different to ours, especially insofar as how their laws are written. So firstly, they classify laws differently to South Africa. That's one issue. Uh, secondly, they have a whole lot of institutions and entities dealing with different things. And the SEC is one of those. So saying that that may work in South Africa, it, it may work, but you're looking at changing the way our approach to crime and the recovery of proceeds and, and entities dealing with, with fining, et cetera. So I, I know we have the Prudential Authority and we have those entities under the banking system uh th those some of those amendments are new and i'm and and uh, i honestly haven't done uh, enough uh, we haven't done enough uh, uh research along those lines of what the banks are empowered to do such as the prudential authority and the uh finserve etc so i think it's something that we've got to look at and see how far we model our law is already modeled along similar systems in the us but as it stands I think we've got to bear in mind that we run totally different systems um, from the US and, and importing such a system may be difficult, but it's something that, that uh, of course, we need to research further and, and uh, consider. So thank you, Jonathan. That's all I have to say.